mate, which is iron, sulfur, and aluminum. In addition, you've got this potassium and extra manganese. Ex manganese at around three or four percent. You see, that's a lot more than you have in uh, structural steel from the World Trade Center sample. Carbon's a little different, but that doesn't help you much because <clears throat> the background here is carbon tape. So I think this is uh, exciting data. It's publishable. We will be publishing it. Now, I have to <clears throat> And uh, as I told Alex on the radio show, I was very glad this was going to be at a university environment so I could feel free to talk about it. That's typically what we do as scientists. We talk about our data, and then we publish them. But we do that, uh, we talk about them before we go to the media. See? So that's, that's the way it is. And uh, I learned that from, uh, gosh, a couple times. Uh, Pons Fleischmann <laughs> experience, they went to the media first. And then they published, but, and there, the physicists I know at their university were very displeased with them because they heard about it first from the press conference, see? Whereas, now, this is a public meeting, everyone's invited, it's at a university setting, we can talk about it, and now we can uh, talk about it wherever. Okay, turns out the USGS, as I did some research, also talked about spheres in the dust and in particular, iron-rich spheres. Here, they show in there, it's called the uh, World Trade Center Dust Atlas, uh, words to that effect. Um, if, if you Google on USGS WTC Atlas, you'll be able to get this picture. This is one of their spheres. It is very similar in, in many ways, size and so on to the spheres that we have seen and analyzed. Here's another, they only show two of these spheres. <clears throat> and these, this sphere, for some reason, was not in very good focus in the USGS <clears throat> uh, uh, atlas, but you see the comparable to the sphere, very smooth and uh, almost perfect sphere in both cases. So, <clears throat> I called up, as I looked at this, the leader uh, of the uh, USGS uh, electron microscopy lab in Denver. He was uh, one of the prime authors on this study. They don't have much data there. And I wanted to find out, had they seen this? Had they not seen this? <laughs> I mean, as a responsible, trying to be a responsible person, I thought, well, maybe they had seen this and they had a good reason for not talking about these spheres much. They do have two pictures. <clears throat> so I called up uh, Dr. Meeker on the phone. I uh, found him in his lab. He said, who are you? And I said, I'm Stephen Jones. Didn't ring a bell with him. <laughs> he said, who are you with? Well, anyway, uh, to make a long story short, <laughs> I told him I was with S&J Scientific Company, which is true. That's the my, my own little company, which I've had for about 15 years, and I'm the president of it, and that's still, so that's true. I'm the only employee, by the way, right now. <laughs> I'm self-employed, if you, okay, so anyway, that's true, it's all true, and he was uh, willing to answer some questions, so I said, do you remember the iron-rich uh, spheres that you observed in the World Trade Center dust? Oh yes, he remembered that. Do you remember what was in that? In that, I mean, did you do uh, much analysis? Gosh, I can't remember. He said, I and mean, maybe he didn't. It's been about two years since the the uh, USGS report came out. By the way, uh, Jim Gurley, I think this might be another request for uh, uh, FOIA, for example, <laughs> to release their information because. You, when you look inside, it's striking, isn't it, to see iron, aluminum, and sulfur in, in these quantities. Uh, and then potassium and manganese. I mean, you know, if you've had any chemistry, you think, wow, potassium permanganate, I mean, you know, it just looks like. Of course, maybe he's totally unfamiliar with uh, thermite. I said, do you have any explanation for these iron-rich spheres? He said, well, Maybe it's because uh, on the at ground zero, they were cutting up the steel with the oxyacetylene torches and those little uh, steel spheres got into the... Uh... See, I'd already looked for that. 
I mean, that was a hypothesis I wanted to check. And I had looked for that and I said, look, uh, you, you know as well as I do that the steel <laughs> is mostly iron. And uh, when you melt it, you'll get the oxygen. But we have seen a large fraction of aluminum in there as well. And I think I mentioned the sulfur also. Have yeah. Secured these yeah. <laughs> have I secured the samples? Yes. Yes. My. my uh, uh, yes. They're secured. <laughs> <laughs> and furthermore, I have a sample of these microspheres. Uh, I gave them to another scientist. I didn't tell him where they came from. I asked him, would you analyze these for me? A blind test. He's willing to do that. He's an expert on XEDS. And that's what we do as scientists, you know, we test with other people. So I, I'm trying to cover the bases correctly here. And, um, uh, you know, and I said furthermore to Dr. Meeker, I said furthermore, if it's, it doesn't have the composition of steel. He pretty much conceded that, even though he couldn't remember just what was in there. But the other thing was, I said, look, the work at the World Trade Center, how could those droplets travel? Let me just go on here. Oh, this is from the USGS report. It shows the location of where they took samples and the gross composition of the dust. Uh, let me see here. Right in here would be ground zero. Some of these samples were very far then, you know, blocks, blocks away. And I asked him, didn't you see these uh, iron rich spheres? I knew that they had seen them. He said, yes, they're not uncommon, he said. And then later he said, frequently seen, <laughs> you know. And of course, if you know the simple trick of using a magnet, to concentrate them. You can find, even if they're in small quantities, you can pull them out, and with an electron microscope, you can see them. We have this one pretty well nailed, folks. The other possibility I thought of, so it's not that, it's not steel, clearly. Not steel melted in the buildings, not aluminum. Uh, reacted with steel, we tried that. But the, uh, the above would be ruled out by the composition anyway. Where would you get sulfur? potassium, manganese, uh, as well as aluminum and iron in these, um, in these little spheres. So there's one chance left that I can see. Thermate used during cleanup. Ah, we still have that argument. The spheres found too far away. You can be sure that the de they're called debunkers, the ones trying to annihilate any of our. <laughs> but you see. Uh, yeah, I won't go into that, but they're, I don't know if they're here tonight, but let me help you out, folks. This one is not going to work either because, first of all, thermate was not used as uh, anyone, if anyone seriously says, oh, it could be thermate used, then I'd say, well, do you have any documentation that it was used at ground zero? The second thing is we have done, you, you, look, when you hear these things, you think, ah, oh, I'll do an experiment. Will it travel? Uh, blocks and blocks when I do a thermate reaction. You know, I cut through a steel cup, the little drops, I could see these sparks flying out. Okay, how far did they travel? About this far. Now, we're talking about blocks and blocks. Furthermore, the apartment building is about a football field away, and it's on the fourth floor, <laughs> and she was in there just as soon as she could, just a, just a few days after the disaster collecting the dust, bless her heart. See, so this is nail. This is correlated with the dust. In fact, there were reports early on, that is the uh, people that looked at this dust, trying to figure out what characterizes World Trade Center dust. And one of the things they came up, came up with was these iron ridge spheres. And for some reason that was put on a back burner. We won't use that as an uh, identifier. So these Thermite reactions, now this is from a group, Materials Engineering Incorporated, that looks for thermite in, in incendiaries. Use of thermite reactions as incendiaries has gained popularity with arsonists. When thermite reaction compounds are used to ignite a fire, or to cut through steel in this case, uh, 
They produce a characteristic burn pattern, like for instance the flowing orange material. There's other characteristics that